It's science time. Hope you're having a great day today. We're going to learn some more about science uh, now. And uh, we're on page 247 in our science book. So get your science book out. Hey, listen, you got to follow along your science book. And especially you need to pay attention to the vocabulary because last week we had some really low grades on those vocabulary assignments. And there's no reason to because you got your science book right in front of you with the vocabulary words in them. Don't be too lazy to find the definition in your book. It's just practice. So you can find the definition in your book. The goal is not to make an F on the assignment because you just guess. The goal is to learn these words. And so I create those assignments for you to have to go back in your book and make sure you know what each one of those words mean. So today, get your book out. Don't just sit and listen and don't just skip the lesson and try to guess on the assignment. You need to listen. This is a very important part of this unit. Lesson five, beginning on page 247. If you need to pause the video and go get your book, do it now and then come back and get ready for our lesson. So we're looking at this question today. How are living things adapted to their environment? Did you see the old camel in the video before this one? He was adapted to his environment. What were some of the things on his body that helped him survive in the desert. Well, he had the hump, an extra layer of fat. He had thick eyelashes that kept the sand out of his eyes. He had big hoofs that helped him walk in the sand. He had better traction than a Jeep, he said. He had fur that controlled his uh, body temperature. So yeah, those are adaptations, things on the animal's body, or we're gonna find out today too, things, that, that ways that they react that um, help them survive in their environment. So how are living things adapted to their environment? Look at this little fox here. What do you think are some of his adaptations or her adaptations? Well, the color of her fur is one, right? She's living in the snow or he, it's living in the snow and it's kind of high, it's kind of a camouflage in the snow because of the white fur. So if something was hunting it or trying to hurt it, then it could camouflage itself in the snow. It's hard to see. So that's an adaptation. Let's find out about more about adaptations. This is an interesting lesson. You'll love it. Life on the blue planet. Because most of Earth is covered by water, it's often called the blue planet. Life is found on water, on land, and everywhere in between. The environment consists of all the living and non-living things in an area. Look at the picture on these pages. The environment shown here includes the animals, plants, water, soil, air, and everything else in the picture. Animals and plants depend on their environment to meet their needs. For example, the zebras in the picture get food, water, and shelter from their environment. Earth has many types of environments. For instance, Arctic environments are very cold. Tropical rainforests are very hot. Some type of environments are deep in the ocean. Others are on dry land with very little rainfall. Because there are so many types of environments on Earth, there are also many types of living things. Each living thing or organism is able to survive in its own environment. All living things need food, water, air, and shelter. Organisms in the same environment share resources. So we see the zebra here, but here's like a, a gazelle or something uh, also sharing it. There's probably some crocodiles in the water there, too. They've got to watch out for. So zebras and other animals get their needs from their environment. So they've got to be able to survive in the environment they are living in. Earth's different environments are home to many types of living things. This mountain goat's environment is different from the zebra's environment. All right, here's a do the math using fractions. We've not got to fractions yet, but we will. The largest environment on Earth is the ocean. Water covers about seven tenths out of the Earth's surface. The rest is land. Use this information to determine how much of the Earth's surface is land. Well, if we're looking at a, a pie graph like this, this big blue part would represent the water, seven out of 10 parts, and the land would be how many? If there's seven out of 10, then how many are left out of 10? 10 minus seven would be three out of 10 parts would be land, or three tenths of the Earth is land, seven tenths of the Earth is water. Who's out on a limb? If you were in a forest, which bird would you expect to be up in the trees? A blue, dray, blue jay or an ostrich? 
That would be scary seeing an ostrich up in a tree. I would run, I think, if I saw an ostrich in a tree. Did you guess a blue jay? You are right. Blue jays are small and have feet that can grip the tree branches. Ostriches are large. They have long legs and wide, strong feet. Blue jays have adaptations that help them live in trees, while ostriches do not. An adaptation is a characteristic that helps a living thing survive. There is the first word you're going to need to know. An adaptation is a characteristic that helps a living thing survive. So ostriches live on the grassland, so they have long, strong legs that help them run quickly in open spaces. Their brown color helps them to blend in. Prairie dogs have strong paws for digging burrows. Their brown color enables them to blend in with their environment. So color, the color of an animal, is an important part of its adaptations, isn't it? A physical adaptation, here's another word you need to know, pay attention. A physical adaptation is an adaptation to a body part. So color is a physical adaptation. Those type of feet an animal has is a physical adaptation. The type of beak an animal has is a physical, physical adaptation. The type of claws or type of fur an animal has is a physical adaptation. A physical adaptation is a body part. It's something on the animal itself. Living things have different physical adaptations based on their specific environments. For example, plants and animals in open spaces have different physical adaptations than living things in forest. In open spaces, grasses can bend in the strong winds. Grassland animals have coverings to blend in with the grass. These animals may be able to run fast or have shovel-like paws for burrowing. Living things in forest have physical adaptations to live in and around trees. Vines can climb up trees to reach the sunlight they need. Many forest animals can grip branches. So physical adaptations here. The blue jay's curved feet help it grip small branches. Its wings enable it to fly from branch to branch. The sloth's long claws help it to hang from tree branches for most of its life. A sloth can even sleep without letting go of the branch. Hmm. So animals have different types of adaptations. Prairie dog's adaptations and the sloth's adaptations are different. Prairie dog needs to have paws that'll let it dig in the ground and burrow. And a sloth, he doesn't dig in the ground. He's got paws to help him hang from trees, doesn't he? So adaptations from vary from animal to animal. Who can go with the flow? Some living things swim upstream while others just go with the flow. Which adaptations do living things need in different water environments? Imagine you live in a constantly flowing stream of water. How could you stay in the same part of the stream without being carried away? Many fish that live in streams have smooth bodies and strong tails. These characteristics help fish swim against the current. Water plants have flexible stems that allow them to bend with the flow. Many water insects are able to hold on, to hold on tightly to water plants. Other insects burrow into the soil at the bottom of the stream. So not only do animals have adaptations, but plants do as well. Like this, plants that grow underwater, they flow and they can bend without breaking as the stream water rushes over them. This fish has a smooth streamlined body. Its body shape allows it to swim quickly in fast moving water. Elodia are very flexible plants, so flowing water is less likely to break them. If a piece of Elodia is pulled off though, the piece can sprout roots and start to grow in a new part of the stream. So adaptations, smooth body, strong tail, bendable parts, all work in the water. Plants in still water, such as ponds and lakes, have different adaptations. Some plants are tall and have strong stems, so they can grow above the water. Others, such as water lilies, just float on the surface. Animals that live in lakes and ponds are excellent swimmers. Many are adapted to living in deep water with little light. Catfish have whiskers that sense chemicals in the water to help them find food in the dark. Some birds wait at the shore and hunt. Their long, thin legs look like the cattails, so fish do not see them until it's too late. And that cattail is not a cattail, but it's these right here, these plants. Cattails grow in relatively still, shallow water, such as the water of a pond. Their stems are strong and stiff. Cattails can grow to more than three meters. That's nine feet tall. So that's a tall plant. And those birds walking around that said have skinny legs that look like these plants so the fish don't know they're about to grab them and eat them. 
Pond turtles are strong swimmers. They're also able to hold their breath for a long period of time. Their dark color allows them to stay hidden in dark, muddy water. What do you think that adaptation of a turtle's shell is? It's for protection for sure, right? Something might want to chomp down on that little turtle and he hides his head and feet in the tail in the, in the shell and can't bite through the shell. So that's another adaptation on the turtle. Who can take the heat? Deserts are places that are, get very little rain. Some deserts are very hot. How do plants and animals live in such hot, dry places? Well, desert plants and animals have physical adaptations. Remember, physical adaptations are on their body that help them stay cool and conserve water. Many desert plants have waxy coatings on their stems to minimize water loss. Many of these plants have very long roots to reach water that's deep underground. Some desert plants have wide root systems that can absorb lots of water when it rains. Desert animals have physical adaptations to keep them cool. Some have short, thin fur or no fur at all. Okay, look at this reptile here. Many reptiles live in the desert. This lizard's scales help it keep water inside its body. It's a horned lizard. Okay, he's also got those little horns. What do you think they're for? That's an adaptation, isn't it? For protection, so animals don't want to bite down on that spiky looking part. There's a jackrabbit. Look at that big old jackrabbit. They have large ears. Their ears release body heat and help the hair stay cool. So did you think of that? They got, not only are their ears made for hearing, but they also let a lot of heat out. Let's turn the page. Remember, follow along in your book. Here's some more words on this page you need to know. 255. A behavioral adaptation. Now, remember, we just talked about physical adaptation, but this is a behavioral adaptation. A behavioral adaptation is something an organism does, not, what on, well, not what's on its body. If it's on its body, it's physical. But if it's something it does, it's its behavior. A behavioral adaptation is something an organism does to help it survive. For example, most desert animals are active at night to avoid the heat of the day. An instinct is a type of behavioral adaptation. An instinct is an inherited behavior an animal knows how to do without having to learn it. For instance, jackrabbits stay crouched in one position whenever they sense danger. This instinct helps them hide from predators. Other behaviors help organisms survive in the desert. For example, some seeds of desert plants stay dormant or inactive until it rains. When it rains enough, the seeds grow quickly into plants that flower and make more seeds. So let's just review this. A physical adaptation is something that's on an animal's body. A behavioral adaptation is something the animal does to help it survive. You know, think about wolves. What do they do to get food? They have a behavior of hunting in packs. Um, rabbits, and when they're being chased, they run in zigzag patterns. So the animal has a hard time catching them. Those are behavioral adaptations, something an animal does. What about bears and things that hibernate in the winter to help them survive? Sure, that's a behavioral adaptation. Some animals do things by instinct. They just know how to do it when they're born. Nobody has to teach them to it. They don't have to learn. It's just something animals can do uh, because it's instinctively in their, in their, in their brain. Saguaro cactus flowers open and release their fragrance at night and close the next day. It is cooler at night in the desert. As a result, the flowers do not wilt as quickly as they would during the day. Who can take the cold? Polar environments are very cold places. How do plants and animals survive in cold places such as Antarctica and the Arctic? Temperatures in Antarctica get rarely get above freezing, even in the summer. Plants and animals that live there have adaptations to live in extreme cold. Emperor penguins have a thick layer of fat. Me too. A physical adaptation that keeps them warm on land and in the water. So physical adaptation, it's on the animal's body. A penguin has a layer of fat to keep them warm. To protect themselves from very cold winds, male penguins huddle together in large groups. Now that's a behavior, isn't it? Something they do. The behavior is an instinct that helps male penguins and their newly hatched babies, penguins keep warm. So their body, the fat in their body is a physical adaptation. Huddling together to stay warm is a behavioral adaptation. So I hope you're seeing the difference between those two. And black feathers on the backs of emperor penguins absorb heat from the sun, which helps them keep warm. That's on its body. So it's a physical adaptation. 
The Antarctic pearl wart, warts grows close to the ground in the warmer, wetter parts of Antarctica. So it's a plant that stays close to the ground, stay warmer in Antarctica. The Arctic has extremely cold winters and very short summers. Arctic animals have thick fur and a layer of fat to keep in the body heat. Some Arctic animals are often white in the winter. We saw the fox on the first page, and here's an Arctic hare. It's white. You can barely see it, but it's eyes and nose there. Arctic animals have thick fur and a layer of fat to keep them in, keep the keep in body heat. Some Arctic animals are often white in the winter, which helps them blend in with the snow. These characteristics are physical adaptations because they're on their body. Arctic animals are, have behavioral adaptations. For example, many Arctic animals live in dens dug into the ground or snow in a very cold months. So they behave, they, one of the behaviors is to dig underground to stay warmer. Most Arctic plants have short roots because the ground there is frozen the majority of the year. These plants produce seeds during the short summer when the ground isn't frozen. Most Arctic plants grow close to the ground, which helps protect them from strong, cold Arctic winds. This prairie crocus has fuzzy hairs that cover its flower and seeds. The hairs protect the plant from wind and trap the heat from the sun. Ever seen a fuzzy plant? It's pretty, isn't it? Arctic hares grow white fur in the winter to blend in with the snow. They sit with their paws, tails, and ears tucked in to keep them from losing body heat. It says, what adaptation affects the stability of Arctic hares and jackrabbits in their environment? What? What adaptations affect the stability of Arctic hares and jackrabbits in their environments? Well, stability is being able to stay alive. So what adaptations affect it? Well, they've got different colored fur. The Arctic hare has thick fur to keep it warm. He tucks his feet in to keep him warm. He's got white fur um, to, to blend in. That jackrabbit we saw, he can run really fast with those big legs. He's got big ears to keep himself cool. They live in different environments. They're the same kind of animal. They're both bunnies, we'd say, but they have different adaptations to help them survive in the area they live in. The desert is very different than the cold, the cold uh, Arctic snow. So they've got to have different part, body parts, different ways their bodies are made to help them survive, even different behaviors. So summing it all up. So we're going to match these together. I want you to draw a line. In your book, as we go through this, I'm helping you, so it's not hard. So all you got to do is draw the line and listen. Make sure you're doing this. Match each definition to the living thing that has that adaptation. <laughs> Excuse me. <coughs> so all these were in our lesson. A flexible stem that bends in flowing water. Well, that was that Elodia plant that grows in flowing streams. So draw a line from A down to Elodia. Grows white fur in the winter. We saw just on the last page an Arctic hare. Draw a line from B up to Arctic hare. It has white fur in the winter. Which animal has long claws that hangs from tree branches? Is that a prairie dog? No, that was a sloth. The sloth has long claws to help it hang from tree branches. And what did we see in the desert that has flowers that open at night when it's cooler? Was that saguaro cactus? Draw a line from D to saguaro. And what had long claws for digging burrows? It was the prairie dog, of course. Okay. Now we're going to identify each adaptation described below as physical. Remember, physical adaptation is on its body or behavioral adaptation. Okay. Is it something it does? An ostrich has strong legs. Are strong legs something on its body or something that it does? It's on its body, so write physical. Or you can put PA for physical adaptation if you want to. Just I want you to remember physical adaptation is something on its body. An Arctic hare sits for hours to conserve heat. It sits. Is sitting something on its body or something that it does? Something that it does, so it's behavior adaptation. You can put a BA or just write behavior, behavioral. How about the third one? A catfish has whiskers that sense chemicals in the water. Okay, are whiskers something on its body or something it does? They're on its body, so C is a physical adaptation. 
Part D, male penguins huddle together to stay warm. So huddling together, is that something on their body or something they do? Something they do, so that's behavior, behavioral adaptation for D. And E, a fish has a smooth, streamlined body. So its body is smooth. Is that something it does or something it has? Not something it does or something on its body. It's obviously its body. It says it's its body. So it's a physical adaptation. Okay. Hopefully you've got the difference between these two now. All right. So I want you now to put the words in the blanks here. This is where you didn't do so hot last week on uh, one of the lessons. I think it was lesson two. You didn't do you didn't do this, some of you, because you got really poor grades on your vocabulary assignment. So you we've looked at those words, make them fit the blank so you can use it from your vocabulary because your vocabulary assignment is going to come right from right here. So if you get this in your book, use this to do your vocabulary assignment and it's an easy 100. All right. This says draw a circle around the plant that would most likely live in a forest environment. On the line below, write an adaptation or plant that had, write an adaptation the plant has that helps it live in the forest. So which one of these do you think would live in a forest? Well, a cactus really wouldn't. It's more for living in a desert. You know, grass doesn't, if you ever walk through a really thick forest, there's not much grass because the trees keep sunlight from getting to the ground. So it's a vine. The vine has to grow up the trees and try to get to the top of the tree to get some sunlight because plants have to have the sunlight for photosynthesis, right? To help them make their food. So a vine would. An adaptation, well, it's able to grow up a tree so it can get to the light. Snakes and lizards are rarely found living near polar environments. Explain why. Snakes and lizards, they don't live in those cold areas. Why? Do they have fur? No, they don't have any fur to keep them warm. They would freeze to death in the polar environment, wouldn't they? And I don't know how well a snake could slide around on the ice. He might just sit and, sw and squiggle around and freeze to death on the ice. They don't have body. They don't have physical adaptations that help them live in cold areas. Number four, the spider monkey lives in the forest. What physical adaptations does it have that helps it survive in this type of environment? Remember, physical is its body. So what do you see there on the monkey that helps it live in its environment? Obviously, it's got these fingers, these arms that help it hold on to the branches. It's got strong arms to help it hang and hold on. Its back feet have the same kind of things. It's got a tail that can help it balance and hold on to branches, too. Its head can turn like our head turns to see what's around it, to look for the next branch. Okay, those are all things on its body to help it survive in the forest. Number five, a bird called an oyster catcher eats mainly mussels, which is a type of shellfish, kind of like a clam. Look at the chart showing the mussel population over time. What adaptations could help the oyster catcher survive this change in its habitat? So this is the mussel population from 2010 to 2014. And so it's in thousands. So in 2010, there were 200,000 mussels. But in 2014, there's only like 18,000 mussels. So what adaptations would help the oyster catcher survive in this habitat? Hmm. If it eats mainly mussels, well, it would have to learn to eat something else, right? If it can eat a mussel, maybe it can eat a clam or a, something else. So its beak is going to be really important to help it eat mussels. What adaptations could an oyster catcher could help an oyster catcher survive this change? Not having as much to eat, it may have to be able to fly to somewhere else to a new location where there's more mussels. Okay. And this is the next lesson, so we'll stop there. And you don't have a vocabulary assignment today. It's going to be after tomorrow's lesson. And you're going to hear the same vocabulary words tomorrow. But I want you to go back. I'm very serious. Do this on your own right now before you do the vocabulary lesson tomorrow so that you can make it 100. Don't make 40s and 30s on these. There's no reason to because the words are in your book, guys. 
All right. I hope you enjoyed this lesson on animal adaptations. We're going to have another one tomorrow. It'll be a digital lesson. We'll see you then.